The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. We will be starting the webinar in two minutes. Hello, one more minute, we'll be starting the webinar, just giving folks a chance to connect and get set up. One more minute. All right, hello everyone. Welcome to the third in a series of HSX University webinars. This one entitled 21st Century Cures Act for Payers and Providers. My name is Brian Weld. I'm the CTO and CISO at HealthShare Exchange. Thank you all for joining. I uh, just wanted to remind you that uh, we've done two previous ones uh, about encounter notifications and information blocking. They are both available to be viewed. The recordings are available to be viewed at the uh, web address below on the HSX University website. You can also just Google HSX University and get there very quickly. Next slide. So I'm, I'm happy to uh, introduce our speakers. Uh, John Donnelly is a senior advisor for health information technology and exchange standards for HSX. He is an active member of numerous international standards bodies and serves as a technical assessor for certification of products in the ONC's testing and certification program. John is a multi-term board member of IAG International and a fellow of the Healthcare Information Management Systems Society. And our other speaker is Harm Sherpier. Dr. Harm Sherpier is the Chief Medical Information Officer at HSX. Prior to joining HSX three years ago, he was the CMIO at Mainline Health. Harm teaches health informatics and health data science at the Jefferson College of Population Health. He is a fellow of the American Medical Informatics Association. And with that, I will turn it over to Harm. Oh, sorry, forgot the agenda. Uh, so today we're gonna to be covering an overview of the 21st Century Cures Act itself. Um, Harm will highlight some new concepts introduced by the Cures Act, and then Harm will focus on the provider-facing requirements. We'll then switch to the payer-facing requirements uh, with John commenting. And throughout this agenda, we'll be focusing on the requirements for EHR firms and HIEs and how they relate to our HSX members. Now, I'm happy to turn it over to Han. Thank you, Brian. And welcome, everybody. It's uh, fun to discuss this with you all. And as Brian already said, we have covered, um, we have, we have covered the, um, encounter notification in the very first session of HSX University and uh, two weeks ago with Helen Ochozowski, we really looked at the um, information blocking. We're now going to look at the broader perspective and many of the other elements that are in the 21st Century Cures Act. So 21st Century Cures Act is a difficult thing from my perspective. It is not one thing. If you look at it, it's a basket of initiatives 
and and they're not always completely connecting with each other. So it's fairly hard, I think, for either a healthcare organization or for a payer to get their hands around what all should I be doing because it is it is a multitude of things. But there are some themes here. The overriding themes in the 21st Century Cures Act are, first of all, promoting interoperability between payers, between providers, and mostly giving patients access to their data. That's theme number one, interoperability. Theme number two is to do that using Fire-based apps. So interoperability will transition from the way we do it today, mostly through HL7 interfaces, through portals, through um, uh, C CCD exchanges to move toward Fire-based apps. And then thirdly, I said it before, making data available to patients electronically. That Those are recurring themes and they are in every component of the Cures Act. The Cures Act is aimed at two different groups, provider organizations. That section is mostly written by ONC, the Office of the National Coordinator, and that includes a set of requirements for EHR vendors, which we don't go into a lot of detail today because the EHR vendors are not on this webcast, but as a provider, you are kind of in charge of making sure your EHR vendor is certified. So those are folded into your provider requirements. And then we will, uh, John will highlight the requirements that are focused on the payer, mostly coming from CMS. There are also requirements in the Cures Act for device manufacturers and for pharmaceutical companies. We will not discuss those today. That is not part of our audience today. The other two things I would like to discuss is some of the new concepts that are introduced by the 21st Century Cures Act. One is core to everything they're doing is the US CDI, the US core data for interoperability. And John will also talk to us about TEFCA and QHINs, all new terms that are that will become clear once we talk about what the Cures Act does. Cures Act itself. Before we go, I would like to use some of Don Rucker's words. As you know, as you may know, Don Rucker is, um, I don't think he's a Philly native, but he spent many years in Philadelphia when he was the chief medical officer at um, Siemens Health Services and lived in Philadelphia. So I think he's uh, he feels like Philadelphia is part of his background before he took the job as ONC director in DC. Uh, I pulled some of his quotes from Fierce Healthcare and, and he states it very well here. The goal is to give patients electronic control of their medical care, their chart, their information through modern software. It's the patient's data for the patients to control as they desire, rather than purely controlled by providers and payers. So, so while today, and I think we'll get into more detail here, but while today the main access for patients for the data is through the portal, and the portal is often very much controlled by the provider. And and I think what Don says here uh, with modern so with, with this statement is modern software. APIs will modernize how patients get electronic control of their chart. Second statement there, ironically, if we had this rule several years ago, we'd be in a far better spot for knowing what's going on with this pandemic. So he's also trying to say for this and potentially future pandemics, it's better if we have these interoperability capabilities in place. I want to start the overview by highlighting US CDI, the US core data for interoperability. And Rather than going to the website here, I kind of cut and pasted the main website into my screen here so we can all look at it and see what it means. This is the link is down below. It's very easily um, available. And the US core data for interoperability says this is the data set that every EHR vendor is expected to be able to share and that every healthcare provider is expected to share and that even every payer is expected to share. A payer may not have all these data, all these data elements in their database, but whichever one they have are part of the US CDI and should be shared. So it basically sets a floor, a tight definition under what data elements should be shared and um, between provider to provider and also provider to patient. Let's look, look at a couple of these. Some of these you might think, you might say, we're sharing those today, allergies, procedures, immunizations, you are sharing those today. If you're sending out a CCD, most likely it includes those. But there are also some new fields in this US CDI that many, many health organizations may not be sharing today. For example, on the right side here, provenance. That is a new component in US CDI, provenance meaning the metadata, who 
is this piece of data from and when did it so basically get timestamp and who it is from so that recipients can say where did that come from and who contributed that piece of data to uh, to the data set uh, left side assessment and plan is part of USCDI assessment and plan commonly collected on the patient side not always shared but under USCDI the assessment and the plan will now be available for sharing I'm going to page down but on the if you were to go to the website it's basically you're just scrolling down with me here lab results medications demographics in the middle those clearly were things that most organizations already are sharing today but they are clearly part of the USCDI left side the part that I am personally most excited about is clinical notes clinical notes are now part of USCDI and down below you see what it means with clinical notes consults discharge summaries HNPs imaging reports lab reports narrative pathology procedure notes progress notes that is more or less everything every clinical note that might be available in the chart and they should now be shared with the USCDI um, we'll talk about that in, in, in just a second and, and down at the bottom goals and problems so on the previous screen assessment and plan now here goals and problems that means the entire care plan and the entire plan of care is now part of USCDI and will be shared uh, with subsequent organizations and with the patient so what's new in that list I mentioned them already clinical notes all major note types provenance who and when assessment plan goals and problems I think those are new elements of previous versions that now will be shared um, I'm um, the USCDI sets a minimum threshold to what data provider needs to send or share or make available today today the better verb to choose is to sh send most of us send data through a CCD that is the most common way of information sharing today so we will see these elements now be part become part of CCDs and most EHR companies allow you to include all these elements into the CCD by enabling those slots in the CCD so most of us will today be sending those and then going forward we'll go from sending to sharing sharing or making available through fire based API's so yes you can always be able to send a CCD but you can also allow apps using standard API's to access that data from your EHR in which case you're sharing it or you're making it available to patients or other providers to collect that data the effective date for that information sharing is November 2nd 2020 that's next week and I know that most of the providers on the call here today have already been working on this um, so I think you're you're well ahead of this deadline and from what I know is you're all already prepared and ready to do this um, by next week enforcement is unclear we talked about it a little bit two weeks ago in our information blocking section on what exactly will the enforcement look like for this it's a little bit unclear I, I would summarize it as it will not be enforced immediately on that first day it will be enforced later but it's a little bit unclear to what extent it will be enforced later that's why I'm keeping it here as unclear so the reason for USCDI is like I said set a floor be very clear about what EHR vendors need to be able to share to be certified and what healthcare providers and payers need to share when they transition their patients the benefit of course is met many CCDs that we receive as HSX today do not include clinical notes or do not include discharge summaries in many of the CMIO meetings and clinical meetings that we run that is one of the most requested elements the notes the discharge summary the HNP the visit note so I feel that by including it in the in the US CDI we will start seeing more narrative and more documents in the CCD which really adds to the value of the uh, exchange information the expectation is that going forward more CCDs will include nodes which increase increases the clinical value and the impact more data availability better consistency and better, better quality for the data so that is I think the big benefit of uh, stepping up to the US CDI I I also at the same time have a concern or a consideration it also means that CCDs will become large because they now will include many more data elements than you typically include today so so um, there are already some concerns that CCDs can be bulky or overwhelming that's not going to get better they will get more bulky and, and and larger and more comprehensive 
which is good and bad at the same time. It may also, the fact that that happens may actually accelerate the transition to fire-based APIs and therefore find a more uh, precise or, or um, specific way to share information rather than shipping the entire fire. That is something that will, will become clear as we start turning on USCDI. Another thing I'd like to point out as you start implementing the, C C the US CDI is to make sure that those new elements have the appropriate link code. This is also, if you go to the same website and you drill down, you will see that for all these clinical notes here, consultation note, discharge summary, HNP, the expectation is that you will use the proper loin code for those components so that the recipient can know what to do with those pieces of information and will know where to file them. And I think this is pretty new. For most of the organizations I work with, they don't typically use loin codes for these documents. So, so please work with your uh, EHR vendor to make sure that you enable the proper loin code for all these um, documents. And I have a thought and consideration about doing that. As you could see in this screen, USCDI proposes a loin code for most of these data elements. You'll see a consult note there, a discharge summary, and each of those have a loin code. And those are the appropriate loin codes for that document. In some cases though, in particularly for, in particular for imaging, there are more detailed loin codes available. So rather than just saying imaging study, you can be specific about is this a spine study or a foot or a lumbar spine or a knee. And, and I think a consideration for us should be that especially for imaging, but also for some of the other note types is rather than using one single loin code for all of them to try to be more specific to what exactly you are sending here. What type of imaging are you sending? What type of procedure note? What type of consult note? That will greatly in increase the usability for sending and receiving notes. It will greatly help us in our portal or in our CCD to make them more searchable so that you could find the right kind of report. It'll help us in analytics and it'll help us in decision support algorithms. So I, I, I'm framing it here as a consideration or as a, or as a recommendation to say, as you start assigning loin codes to the documentation piece in your US CDI, please consider going to a next level of detail and be specific about the type of um, note that you're including. The next element I'd like to discuss is EHR certification. EHRs will be required in a whole separate section of the Cures Act targeted at EHR firms will be required to support APIs to exchange data, both for patient facing apps and provider facing apps. Those APIs, those electronic interfaces will again, use USCDI as the data set they need to support. There's an interesting requirement called real world testing that EHR vendors need to demonstrate. So when they enable this software, it's not enough that they just test this in a lab. They need to demonstrate that they have these features and functions tested in a real world setting, maybe with a beta site or with, with an actual customer and with an actual exchange between their EHR and some uh, apps. So that is an interesting uh, uh, real world testing challenge for these EHR companies. I am very curious to see how that goes. I'm also very interested to see if some of our HSX members will participate with their vendors real world testing and how that goes. Certification status is very detailed, available through the website that I'm listing here called Chapel CHPL. And I would encourage you for both your own EHR, but also maybe for the other EHRs that are in your health system, go to that website and see what software and what version has the right certification for you to comply with the 21st Century Cures Act. It's very, very detailed. The next topic is that this means a gradual shift from the patient portal to patient apps. And that doesn't mean that the patient portal will go away, but that we will start seeing new ways for patients to access their data. Today, most patients to access their medical record at your health system will use the portal and will sign up for the portal under the Cures Act. That also becomes possible by using fire-based APIs for patient and provider apps. The authentication for those apps will happen through the EHR vendor. So if some, some company comes out with an app that allows me to look at my Epic data or Cerner data or um, Meditech data, 
it's the vendor that will actually through that app create the, the authentication for that patient EHR vendors will be able to share with you which patients are accessing which data through an activity log and, a, and an activity record so what that looks like is today all patient access is handled through the portal which is which is authenticated through you healthcare provider you you hold the the role of um, providing patients with their access and their authorization that as patients start using app will shift toward a direct authentication via their app to the EHR vendor our expectation is, of course, is that both will live side by side. Many patients will use their portal. Some of them may transition to start using apps in the future. I have two more related items that are not part, not directly part of the Cures Act, but I think are worth mentioning, and they fall under the overall regulatory umbrella. One of them is the ADT encounter notification. We this is the topic for our first HSX University, but I want to just restate it here that the Cures Act especially the CMS component, the CMS condition of participation includes the requirement that health systems send notification of encounters, admissions and discharges to anyone else who might be involved in the care for this patient. HSX provides this and we discussed it in great detail uh, on September 29th with Rob Horst and the recording is on our website. The second thing I want to list is also not part of the Cures Act, but I think it's it's very interesting that there is a proposed rule for the 2021 quality payment system, QPP, which is com a component of MIPS. This is quite complicated. There's lots of acronyms in here. It's a component of MIPS. MIPS, of course, is a part of the payment system, the, the, the merit-based incentive payment system that has requirements that you do that used to be meaningful use, and meaningful use is now called promoting interoperability. You see that on my slide here, promoting interoperability. That is the new name for what used to be meaningful use. In there is a proposal that simply by being part of an HIE, you've met the requirements. Participation in an HIE, like HSX, for bidirectional data exchange enabled for all patient encounters would automatically in one version check the box for promoting interoperability. We think that's going to be a great benefit for all health systems, all practices that are part of HSX, because basically just by their participation and by making sure they have the bi-directional data exchange turned on, in other words, you receive CCDs and you send CCDs, by having that turned on, you automatically qualify for the promoting interoperability component of your MIPS. We will get more information about that. We will send that to you, but it's, I think, interesting to see, and I would encourage you to keep an eye on that because it makes your attestation so much easier. That's the summary for the health system, the provider component of um, the Cures Act. I would now like to transition to John, who will look at how the Cures Act impacts payers. But I think almost in a triangular fashion also impacts providers. So I encourage you, if even if you're a provider organization, please also be aware of what payers need to do under the Cures Act. John, I'm gonna hand it over to you here. Thank you, Harm. Uh, really great summation in my estimation of you know, what the provider should be looking at uh, with this Cures Act. Uh, you know, I will comment though that the, the one thing that did come out of the CMS final rule was this uh, information about the uh, the ADT notification on providers. Normally the CMS kind of stays out of that space. This was kind of a very unique uh, you know, requirement that they put into the CMS side. So, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so uh, my pleasure here to talk to you about uh, the final rule and how it uh, will impact the payer members of HSX. Um, uh, as you all know, HSX uh, was one of the first HIEs in the country to actually have payer members as founding members and then has now moved to have uh, all the payers uh, that are service, servicing its uh, community um, now part of its membership. So that is quite a milestone to have achieved and really helpful, I think, in uh, having the, uh, the HIE uh, service the full breadth of needs uh, in, in the community. Um, so what is about the CMS Cures Act? So, so uh, unlike the prior uh, kind of final rules that came from CMS, uh, which just kind of pointed at things that came out of the O&C final rule, the CMS 
final rule, this pass actually puts specific things out there for the payers to follow, right? So uh, first of all, they can only do it for payers over which they have jurisdiction, right? So uh, the thing is, you know, besides the ones, the government programs that they run, uh, any, any plans that uh, provide Medicare Advantage plans or CHIP or Medicaid um, or qualified health plans uh, there uh, would be subject to the requirements here. Right, so this is a kind of a, a a pretty strong leap, pretty strong statement by CMS to actually put these things out here for payers to adhere to. Now the thing is, they didn't go as far as the ONC rules that says that you had to go and get a product tested and certified. So the products that you are using um, are still going to be verified by CMS audits and attestations and things like that. So they didn't actually say no. In order to satisfy the the, the the CMS requirement, you have to get a certification seal of, of, of anything like they do on the ONC side. Um, however, in the API space, there they kind of crossed over quite a bit and, and Harm just talked quite a bit about the API space. Um, and the thing is with APIs is that uh, they are now leaning on the requirements that are out of the ONC rule as to what happens with APIs, right? So you see there the target enforcement date but the thing to know about the actors in an API model is that you typically have three players, right? You have the developer of the API, you have the API data resource, and you have the API user, right? So if we look at the model of patient access APIs for the payers that are in the CMS rules, um, typically the payer is the API data resource, right? That, that's a role you are gonna be in. Um, you might be in an API tech developer role, right? Because some of you do have your own uh, IT development staffs and that you might want to do that, or you might contract with somebody else to be in that. And the API user in this case is actually the patient or your enrollee in your plan, right? Now, the thing that, that's interesting about the way they've structured the rule is they wanted to make sure that the payer is the one responsible and considers themselves responsible no matter how they automate their systems. No matter what they do for claims or clinical data capture, um, it's the requirement of the payer that that gets done. So whether it's outsourced or they do it internally. Uh, the other thing they wanted to do is they recognize that, that health plans very often have to cover things uh, that cover family membership access, right? Because uh, you know you can have an enrollee who is in the plan but is actually a family member and that family member should have somewhat equivalent access requirements or, or capabilities as does the enrollee, right? So that is intended to be continued. So whatever your plan allows uh, in terms of family member access pre final rule and free pre API, um, you should be also supporting that here. So some might add a little bit of some technical challenges that you need to talk to your uh, API tech developer uh, or internal IT department about, right? The other thing is, of course, we, uh, Harm mentioned about USCDI. Um, the interesting thing here is that for the payers that was recognized that they may not have all those data sets, right? Those data categories that Harm highlighted. Um, however, things that are maintained, and they had a very specific definition of maintained here in terms of having access to the data, control over the data, and the authority to make it available, then that is something that they should share, right? The other thing they put out there was a look back period that says the period of information that you are to share is for enrollees in plans back to January 1, 2016. Right, um, and ideally, it should be shared in the FHIR format. Right, so that's the intention here that you go back to 2016 for enrollees in the plan. And we'll talk more about this a little bit as we look at the payer payer data exchange requirement of, of the final rule. The other thing I want to mention here is that this is not in the rule, very specifically called out as a requirement. However, in their terms, they use the thing suggested option. Uh, most of you, most of the payers here on this call uh, know about the Da Vinci project. They have been very busy for the last few years developing implementation guides. And there is one that's called the Payer Data Exchange IG that is a suggested option here for supporting this API requirements uh, in, a, in a very 
specific way. Um, and the other one is something that's coming from the Karen Alliance. They have an IG for Blue Button, uh, and that's for sharing EOB kind of data with the, with the patient. So the, the last one is not specifically in the file, final rule, but it is in the Da Vinci work. So it's, it's kind of like sharing one thing with another. All right. So that's on that API. The second one that they did was, was to visit a topic that's been out there quite a while, the provider directory, all right? So the provider directory API has the same basic three API actors. And in this case, you're probably going to be the data resource. The, the, the payers will be the data resource for that. Um, and again here though, the user could be either the patient or provider. So this is not constrained to just a provider accessing your provider directory, but also, uh, or a patient accessing your, your provider directory, but the provider as well, all right? So you can expect that the app's coming from either side, all right? Again, the, uh, the guidance, soft guidance, is to look at what the Da Vinci work has done around something called PlanNet. Um, there is a new flavor of a directory that is now uh, been through ballots on the standard side and is being promoted. It's a fire-based directory. So it's called the validated healthcare directory. And there's this very specific uh, guidance there that is out there. And the Da Vinci Project has looked at that and has built that into their IG for PlanNet. All right, so it's something to keep an eye on. The other thing related to provider directory uh, that was in the final rule is that CMS has uh, noted that they are going to increase their oversight uh, on the what they'll call the digital contact information for the providers. You know, we know that for many years now there's been a direct address associated with providers. Um, that or a fire API endpoint is now going to be looked at in their NPES, so in their, their actual provider directory that uh, is maintained by, by the government here, um, they have to have a, 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 an endpoint in there of that sort. Um, now, you also know HSX is also has a provider directory uh, that has been informed by both providers and payers in its membership, um, and we're just going to verify that all the provider entries that we have in this directory have one or more digital contract uh, contact uh, entries, right? So, which is not uh, that uh, unheard of because we've been using that for our, our direct addressing and our direct uh, sense of, of information, right? Okay, the third one, um, which is, is quite a lift, I think, for the, the payers, um, and that's why the target date actually has been put out there as, as 2022, um, and that is that an enrollee can actually request uh, and authorize that a payer share its prior exchange information with another payer, right? So the, the requirement here is to try to have that continuity uh, from payer to payer for a given patient, given individual, right? Um, and again, it uses that January 1, 2016 date as that look back period. Um, however, it's a little softer on the USCDI requirement, right? They, they knew, think that that's where they wanted to go with it. Um, however, uh, by the law today, uh, it does not require to be in FHIR format, right? So you can send data uh, to another payer that has been authorized by an enrollee uh, in another format. So it could be a PDF format or, or I don't know whether you would do CCD, but you could do a, a, another format. However, it's recommended that you start moving in that FHIR direction, in that USCDI fire direction. Uh, and that's because you have to do it anyway, right? You have to do it for the patient access uh, API. So, you know, putting that in motion and then having that same data available for a payer payer data ex exchange makes, makes a lot of sense. I think it makes sense from a technical development standpoint, right? The other things that they did in the final rule were they, they put a little bit of definition around um, you know, what are your requirements if you now have to share data to another payer that you might have gotten from a prior payer, right? Because you can think of, a, of an enrollee that you had um, and it moved to another payer and there's a litany now, a, a sequence of exchanges. Um, your obligation is basically to uh, minimally put it in the data format you got it, right? So you don't have to convert it to FHIR. Uh, you know, out of the gate to satisfy this requirement, 
Um, however, that is the direction things are going. Uh, if you did receive it in fire, then minimally you're sending it out in fire, right? So you're sending the CDI out in, in the fire. And again, I think as, as Har mentioned and was mentioned earlier, your requirement for USCDI is what you maintain. You don't make stuff up. You don't say, I think this is what the case is. So the objective here is to work with what you have. The expectation is that more and more will become available uh, and be shareable, um, and you will be maintaining more and more of it. So, so that's kind of the, the, the intention going forward. All right. Uh, the Medicare uh, fee-for-service program um, is developing the capability to support this payer-payer data exchange as well. So, um, so the uh, the CMS uh, guys are are also stepping up to at least uh, you know follow their own guidance here in this regard. Okay. Okay. So that was the three major requirements that uh, CMS had in their final rule, final rule for the payers. The other item that is out there that didn't come from CMS in this case is actually something from ONC, um, but it does affect uh, HSX and the HA HIEs and, and the, the entities to which payers belong and providers belong, right? And that is this TEFCA program. It stands for Trusted Exchange Framework and Common Agreement. Um, it is intended to build a network of qualified health information networks, right? So uh, HSX, um, you know, is like an entity that could be considered to be a qualified health information network. It is expected, as you see in the picture, that a QHIN will have participants. So we have, they call them participants, HSX calls it members, right? Um, so it is possible and expected that a QHIN participating in this nationwide network would uh, have its own membership to which it needs to provide services and be supportive in, into that network. Um, main things at this point is that there are very specific purposes of use defined. So of course the HIPAA ones, uh, treatment payment operations, but there's some others that have been discussed uh, by the planning committee um, and are being looked at as being required for the purposes of use. Uh, the, the thing is, is that the QHIN, when you are a QHIN, you would have to support all of the purposes of use that are documented in the agreement, right? So the intention is that there is not any, uh, you know, uh, I would say cherry picking of what I can do and what I can't do. If you're a QHIN, you have to support all the purposes of use as defined. Right? And you have to be able to do it in the variety of ways. Okay, I think HSX provides the same kinds of things. It does document query and retrieve, and it does message delivery, uh, you know, like the send things. So those things would be supported by the QN already. Um, and again, we're looking at a kind of a transitional state through the CCDA, the CCD type of exchange uh, to one that is then more USCDI fire-based uh, with an expectation around January 1 of 2022 that that would all be the FIRE USCDI-based things, okay? So right now, we, as, as HSX um, is very actively reviewing what the requirements are and participating in the work groups and the task force and things related to, to QNs, um, but it's going to evaluate its value to its members. You know, does it make sense to become a, a QN, okay? And, and I think the, the good news here is that because of the breadth of payers that are members of HSX, the recently formed Payer Advisory Committee uh, by HSX is there to, to discuss the needs and satisfying and helping the payer members of HSX in how do they uh, support these, uh, these new requirements that came from the CMS. Right? So with that, uh, Harm, I'd like to hand it back to you for a brief recap. Thank you, John. Stay on the screen with me, though. Um, th thank you. V very, very interesting. And, and as you could tell, every new law brings a set of acronyms, names, concepts, and this is no exception, right? That there are so many new words and terms that we need to learn and become familiar with and learn how to, to um, put in place. So briefly recapping our theme, and then we will um, open it up for questions. 21st Century Cures Act, part provider, part payer, part EHR company. It's all about interoperability. 
It's payer to payer, P2P, provider to provider, which is also P2P, provider to patient, which is also P2P. Uh, you get my drift here. It's all about P2P, whether that's provider or patient or, or payer. Everybody needs to be able to interoperate with everybody else in our um, healthcare player field. USCDI, we talked about it. API enabling, application program interface enabling both payers and providers to allow patients and providers to use apps to get their data. We talked about the ADT notification compliance through HSX. That was the session on September 20, 29th. MIPS compliance. A new rule, and we will communicate with you more frequent more as we get more information. But I think it's going to be very beneficial to most HSX members is that they can use this bi-directional HI exchange to comply to their MIPS um, requirements. And um, HSX will be enabling cures requirements wherever applicable, however applicable through the data exchange through supporting a set of APIs and also simply just through this set of HSX university updates to make sure that our membership is up to date and aware of what they should be doing. At this point, this point I would ask, ask Brian, can you help us find some questions and um, what are questions out there in the audience we should be talking about? Sure. Uh, the first one is, is the CDI a fixed data set or will it change over time? Um, I will start with that, and John, if you have more to add there. So the current version of the US CDI is labeled as version one. There is already a tab out there for version two. So clearly there will be additional subsequent versions. Um, also on that same US CDI um, website is a method for requesting additional fields. So the, the thought here is that parties, participants, providers, anybody can request additional fields to be added to the US CDI. I believe there's a committee who will vet those requests and how they will see if it's a valid request and potentially add them to upcoming versions to the US CDI. So today it's a version one, but we anticipate that that set will grow as we go along. John, am I right about that? Harm, 100% correct. And uh, as a matter of fact, the version two is already at a state of uh, being put out there for input. Um, and a number of the uh, standards bodies and project work, Da Vinci included, um, have uh, made some suggestions for some additional elements to be added. So there's clearly um, an intention that USCDI would not be a static thing. It would grow over time um, as uh, implementers start to bring it out and interoperability starts to happen more, uh, you know, what should be required. And an extension to that question, are there changes to the CCD standards and the FIRE standards to support USCDI? And if so, when will they be available? Yes, there, there were. There's this, this ongoing work. I mean, the, the thing that uh, many people don't know is that uh, HL7 um, is the father of both the CDA, CCD guidance and specifications and the FIRE things, right? So uh, it got there in different ways, um, uh, but it is a new language and a new um, uh, specification from HL7 that is being picked up by other standards bodies, including um, IHE and, and how it's done work. Um, so the, the uh, owners inside of HL7, the, there's a work group there, um, is responsible for uh, defining the cross mapping and the transition from their current standard to the FHIR standard. So the US core part of US CDI is actually uh, grounded in the HL7's work around US core. So, so the, uh, each of the work groups inside of HL7 um, handle the, the cross mapping and the transition. And, and that includes version two stuff, right? We haven't talked much about version two, but you know, your ADT messages are typically done in, in, in version two HL7 speak. Um, and there is actual work going on to transition them into a fire language. All right, switching gears a little bit. Um, do providers have to push data automatically or only upon a patient's request? Let me see if I can answer that. 
I'm going to answer it backward. Upon a patient request, definitely. Right. In many cases, from a provider perspective, patient request for sure. Um, and that is, of course, also the intent with an app. An app basically can constitutes an electronic request for data. So, so if a patient uses a, an app on their phone or on their computer to request data, it's at their request. So the Fire app will reply to that on the patient app. Um, on the payer side, it's a little different. And John, you can maybe mention that in just a second, where I think all exchange is based at the patient's request. Provider to provider, though, I think that's the other part. If a provider is, if you're sending a patient to a transition, through a transition of care back to the primary care provider, it is expected that you send the CCD. So that is not necessarily the patient's request, but as part of the transition of the patient. Yeah, I think that's right, Harm. Let me just add to that. Um, the prior rules of ONC and, and what, ON, what CMS did in, with its meaningful use work um, put some obligations on the providers to push data, you know, to both receive data and push data right, to downstream providers. Right? So that wasn't necessarily part of this rule, but it's still in there. It's in the 2015 edition of requirements of, of, uh, of the ONC rule. Uh, there is, though, the added addition of the ADT, right? The encounter notification yes. requirement, which did come out in this final rule that did make it obligatory for a provider to push ADTs downstream, mm -hmm. right? And out to other entities that are part of the, the care team. Right. So, so yes, there is a requirement to do both pushing and then to respond to API authorized, uh, authorized APIs. And I want to add one more thing. Remember these, this special requirement the special rule change for QPP that I mentioned that their statement is also bi-directional exchange enabled for all encounters. So, so the expectation is there that for every patient encounter, you will be sending a CCD and for all patient encounters, you will be receiving a ccd now sending that's an active an active part that you do receiving you will receive them whether your provider does or doesn't open that i don't know that that is part of the law but you should be receiving and sending for every encounter um it says it uses the word enabled bi-directional exchange should be enabled for all patients i think that that basically clarifies not just at the patient request but automatically Sticking with that theme, uh, do providers have to do real-world testing of APIs to be compliant? Yeah, it's uh, interesting uh, that you brought that up, Brian, because uh, I know Harm had it on one of his slides here. Real-world testing is one of those new things that came at uh, the certified product vendor. Um, in the past, they had to do certain surveillance for their certification, maintaining the certification. Uh, but yes, now real world testing, um, anyone who is certified as an API tech developer needs to, um, on a annual basis, do a real world testing plan and execution with its customers. So it doesn't have to do with all its customers. It has to do it with at least one or all the criteria that it has been certified for, right? So we, we didn't uh, you know, delve into the whole certification criteria thing too much today, but uh, you know, the product gets certified for certain, uh, certain criteria, right? And if the API tech developer criteria is one of the things they are certified for, they do have to do real world testing uh, with uh, at least one of their customers of that product. Great. Um, I don't think we have any other questions unless uh, the audience has more coming. The, 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 I'm not sure if we specified that for the audience to ask questions, they need to type it into the question box or in the chat box. So audience, if you have another question, please type it into your question box or chat box. We can see them coming in. Let's give everybody one more minute before we uh, wrap up today's session. See if there's any final outstanding questions. Nothing coming in. 
let's wrap it up, Brian. All right. Well, thank you all for attending. This uh, webinar was recorded and will be available on the HSX University website in a few days. So please check back there. I think you might even get an email when it's published, but um, feel free to check back. And uh, thank you all for attending. And please uh, sign up for the future next webinar, which I think is November 10th, which features yours truly talking about our certification with high trust and what that process was like. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thank you, John. Right. Brian. Bye, everyone.